Welcome this evening to the Wednesday evening service, May 13th, the Vision Baptist Church, and uh, we're going to be continuing our Bible study in the book of 2 Peter. And, uh, and before we get into the Word of God, I'd like to go ahead and uh, let you know about a few requests. I hope you'll be praying for these, and uh, we'll pray together, and then we'll get into the Word of God. And so let's go ahead and uh, go through some requests, and let's pray. Uh, I do want to remind you about Heather. I hope you'll be praying for her. Uh, she has good days and bad days, but just be praying for her as she goes through all that she's uh, struggling with, with her, her body. And then also uh, uh, be praying for Romy, uh, Romy as she's awaiting her surgery. Uh, she's looking forward to that. I believe it's on May 21st. And so I hope you'll be praying for her as they just scheduled that. And uh, be praying, Lord, just help her to be able to get that taken care of and, uh, and to be able to have that follow-up surgery done. And I hope you'll be praying for Erica and uh, be praying for her heart and all that's going on there and then be praying for Logan and uh, be, continue to be praying for him as that leads up to this uh, uh, June, July time and just be praying that everything would continue to go well uh, with the, the new medication treatment that they're giving him and so hope you'll be praying for him uh, with his digestive issues and, and pain and struggle that he's been having here lately and uh, so please be praying for him. Also be praying for Rhonda and uh, her two sons, Josh and, uh, and Brandon as they continue to, loss, to mourn the loss of their dad and, uh, and husband. And then I hope you'll be praying for those that have been laid off and uh, be praying for them as the uh, Lord just provides and, and provides them a new job too. And then also uh, be praying for this lady named Kim that has been in this coma since December. I hope you'll be praying for her. Uh, she continues to uh, recover from the surgery that she had that she's been in the, re the coma as a result of it ever since. And so hope you'll be praying for her. And uh, be praying for Charlene. She's doing very well. I was able to talk to her there on Sunday, and uh, uh, just uh, she mentioned how that she's doing well and uh, treatments are going well. And so we'll be continue to be praying for her. Uh, be praying for our country. And be praying where we just continue to work in in our leadership. And, uh, and I hope you'll uh, be praying for all of those uh, as they make decisions and all that's going on there. I hope you'll be praying for the Lord just to continue to work. And then also be praying for the Farrier family, uh, as Brother Farrier passed. I hope you'll be praying for them. Uh, be praying for uh, uh, Roy uh, also as he just continues to recover from his, uh, uh, just some issues that he's having with his heart. And so hope you'll be praying for him with the AFib and all that he's been going, going through with all of that. And uh, be praying for the Armstrong's sister-in-law, Sandra. Uh, she is uh, in a nursing home and she's been diagnosed with the coronavirus. Uh, and so hope you'll be praying for for them in the nursing home, and then also be praying for Sandra there and that also. And uh, if you would, be praying for a lady that uh, goes to Fellowship Baptist Church, the church I grew up in, and uh, her name is uh, Martha, and I hope you'll be praying for her as she fell and is recovering, and so hope you'll be praying for her also as she recovers from this fall. Uh, and so let's go ahead and open in a word of prayer, and, uh, and then we're going to give you an announcement or two, and then we'll get into the Word of God. So let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for today. Lord, we thank you for all that you've done and allowing us to be able to, to uh, just worship you and to be able to look at your word tonight. And Father, I pray that you would stir our hearts and help us, Lord, to be able to see some areas in which we need to become more like you. And uh, Lord, we thank you uh, that you've given us your word. And Father, it is a, sure, more, a more sure word of prophecy, Lord, and that it's important for us to uh, take heed and obey and apply to our life. And uh, Lord, we do pray that you would be with these requests that were mentioned tonight. We're to think of Heather. I pray that you would continue to work in her body and, uh, and help her to continue to just uh, uh, recover and just to get through all of her dialysis and all that she's going through. And hope you'll be able to give her just the, the, uh, uh, the grace and Lord, the strength that she needs to be able to go through all of these things. And uh, Lord, we also pray that you would just be with Romy. I pray that you would help her as she uh, is preparing for her surgery. And uh, Lord, I pray that it would go well as she uh, looks forward to that. And uh, Lord, I pray that you would help them to be able to get everything taken care of and that you would just help her to heal up quickly from that. And uh, Lord, we also think of Erica. I pray that you would touch her body and uh, continue to help her to feel well. And Lord, I pray that you would be with her heart and, uh, and help her also even with some of the digestive issues that she's been dealing with on top of it. And uh, Lord, I pray that you would just work in her body also. And uh, Lord, I pray that you would be with Logan and uh, give him the strength and uh, help him to be able to recover from just the problems that he's been dealing with with his body and then uh, also even the medications and things that he's taking. And uh, Lord, I uh, just pray that you would work greatly, Lord, in just working in, uh, in his uh, digestive tract and help it to heal. But Lord, I do pray that you would allow this 
uh, the medication that he's using right now, Lord, I pray that it would be effective and that it would be long-term effective. And uh, Lord, we also think of, uh, of Rhonda and her family. I pray that you would just give them grace and strength, Lord, as they uh, mourn the loss of their loved one. And Lord, I pray that you would just, just meet with them and encourage them and uh, just help them through this time. And Lord, we also pray that you would be with Kim. I pray that you would just strengthen her body and uh, be with her, her brain, Lord, as they had this surgery there in December. And uh, she's been in a coma ever since. And I pray that you would just work in her body through all of that. And Lord, we also uh, just bring before you uh, Charlene. And Lord, I pray that you would just touch her body and just continue to work in her cancer as they uh, uh, continue through these treatments. And uh, Lord, I thank you for the positive news that she's gotten here recently. And I pray that you would just continue to bless and to work through all of that. And uh, Lord, we also pray that you would just be with our country. I pray you'd be with the leadership of our country. And uh, Lord, we pray that you would just give them wisdom, give them direction. And uh, Lord, we thank you that, that even the heart of the king is in your hand. And you can steer them just as you do the waters of the rivers. And uh, Lord, I pray that you would just lead them and direct them. And Lord, even if they don't know you, Lord, I pray that you would just uh, help them to be able to follow you. And uh, Lord, to know that you're the one that's in control through all of the things that are going on in our country. And uh, Lord, we also bring before you uh, just uh, uh, the Armstrong's uh, sister-in-law, Sandra. I pray that you would just touch her body and just help her, Lord, as she is uh, uh, struggling with this coronavirus. I pray that you would just raise her up. And uh, Lord, we also think of the Farrier family. I pray that you would just uh, encourage them and just help them through uh, their difficulty, Lord, as they just uh, mourn the loss of this loved one. And Father, I pray that you would just be with Mrs. Farrier, strengthen her, pray that you'll be with his, his kids, and I pray that you would just uh, give them gr wonderful grace during this time, and I pray that you would just strengthen them through this. And uh, Lord, we thank you so much for the blessing that Bro Brother Furrier was. And uh, Lord, we also think of uh, Brother Roy. I pray that you would just work in his body. And uh, Lord, I pray that you would strengthen his body, Lord, and his back as he has been uh, doing a lot of things just manually uh, here lately. And I pray that you would just continue to give him grace and strength. And uh, Lord, I pray that you would just touch his heart and just help him with the AFib that he's been struggling with and just help him to, to feel well through it all. And uh, Lord, we also pray that you would just be with Martha. I pray that you would just touch her body and help her as she recovers from this fall. And I uh, pray that you would give her the grace that she needs too to recover from that and help her to get well. And Lord, we love you so much. We thank you for salvation. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to serve you. And Lord, I, I do pray that you would just work in our hearts tonight as we look at your word here in the book of Sick and Peter. And uh, Lord, we thank you for your word. And Lord, I pray you would help us to be able to apply it to our life. In Jesus' name, amen. I do want to let you know that uh, at, toward the end of the week here, be looking for a message on Friday, uh, just uh, having to do with when we're going to be reopening and things. And so I hope you'll be looking forward to that, be praying for that. And, uh, and we'll be looking forward to being able to just get to, back together and be able to worship the Lord together. And uh, if you would look there at the book of 2 Peter, we're going to be in 2 Peter chapter number 1, and uh, we're going to read through verse number 5 through verse number 11, and we're going to see a lot of different things that's going to, uh, uh, that's kind of interconnected in this passage, and, uh, and just look at how a, uh, a carnal Christian and uh, a Christian that is struggling in their life can have victory in their life and live in that victorious Christian life. And so let's go ahead and look here at verse number 5 and read down first through verse number 11 of 2 Peter. Verse number 5 says, And beside this, giving all diligence, uh, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue, knowledge, and to knowledge, temperance, and to temperance, patience, and to patience, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful, in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his sin, old sins. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if ye do these things, ye shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you, or unto you abundantly, into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As we begin to look at this, in verse number 8 through verse number 11, we begin to see just some warnings about us not heeding to the principles that's given in verses 5 through verse number 7. But let's look here in verse number 8 first and begin to look at the uh, uh, importance of us doing what is right. In fact, 
uh, if we do, don't follow these things, we're going to find four principles of a Christian that is living outside of the will of God. And in verse number eight, it says, for if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. The first thing we find is a Christian that is unfruitful. Uh, a Christian that is unfruitful. God's plan, God's desire is that none of us are barren or unfruitful. God's desire is that we are reproducing, uh, that we're allowing, uh, allowing us to be able to see people saved and allowing us to be able to see godliness and, and the, the uh, Christ-likeness just come out of us as it should. Uh, God's desire is not for us to live in a life where we are uh, struggling with, with, with uh, uh, being like Christ and a life where we're struggling with doubt and, and of discontentment and discouragement and all those things. That is not God's plan uh, for the Christian. And so he says here, for if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But then in verse number nine, it says, but he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off. The second thing we find is a Christian that's not just unfruitful and barren, but also a Christian that is short-sighted, a Christian that is short-sighted. Uh, he goes on to say in verse number nine, and have forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Have you ever gotten in those times in life where you're just living as if you were never saved? Not that you're necessarily living like a like an unsaved person, but you're living like you have no hope of salvation. You you don't have that hope. You don't have that feeling inside of you to know that you're saved. You realize that you're not saved by a feeling. But I remember hearing an old evangelist, Chuck Cofty, make the statement many years ago that even though we're not saved by a feeling, it sure does feel good to be saved. Praise the Lord that when you know Christ is your Savior, you know it is a fact. It feels good to know that our salvation is of Christ and not of ourselves and of our, of our own abilities. It's what Christ has done to be able to save us. But yet as we look here, he says, but he that lacketh these things is blind. A Christian that, do, that does not have these things in his life is someone that is struggling with blindness spiritually in their life. And not only blind, but even, even if they don't have all these things as evident in their life as they should, they are also nearsighted. They're short-sighted in their life. Uh, they're struggling with what's coming next. They're struggling with trusting the Lord with what's in before them. And I wonder, do we, if we, as we answer this question, is God in control? Absolutely. Absolutely. As we think about God being on the throne, he is in control. He's control of this coronavirus. He's in control of all the things that are going on. He is even in control of the leadership in our uh, political system. And as you look at all that's going on and the fight that's going back and forth with all of those things, God is allowing those things, whether to be that of God's blessing or whether it be of God's judgment, uh, all of those things, God is still at work in, in and through all of that, and he can you even use it in our life to be able to bring us to become more like Christ. We need to be turning our focus away from all the problems of this world and unto the Lord Jesus Christ. That's God's desire, God's plan. But I wonder if we are blinded or short-sighted as a Christian. As we look at each one of these characteristics that are evident for a Christian that is not living, in a victorious Christian life, you'll find that there are varying degrees of not having these things evident. As you look there in verse number eight, you find that there is a varying degree of being barren or unfruitful. You may have a little bit of fruit. You may have a little bit of those things that, that are evident and should be evident in our life, but God desires for us to have life, not just life, but have it more abundantly. That our life is, is showing forth Christ's likeness more than just a little bit, but a lot. But yet, as you look here in verse number nine, he says, but he that lacketh, lacketh, the idea that you are not measuring up and, and having these things evident in our life as we should completely, he says, but he that lacketh these things is blind, blind, we're spiritually blind, and he's speaking here as a Christian, we can have our, our, our view of life blinded because we're not living the way that God desires for us to live. And then he says, and cannot see afar off, cannot see what's coming, cannot have a right perspective on what's approaching our life. As we look at what's happening in our life, ultimately, we need to be looking at it through the eyes of the word of God, 
through the understanding that the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. The Word of God is how we should view all that's approaching our life. And that is how we can have the right view, the right sight, as we look at what's approaching. But as you consider this, uh, I want you to think through this thought. It's uh, short-sighted and forgetting who we are in Christ and that we are even saved. Because look what he says at the end of verse number 9. He says, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. There are many times Christians that will... They'll get saved, they'll start living for the Lord, and then all of a sudden they'll begin to backslide. And they'll even forget the very fact and the, the, the depth of the fact that they are saved in Christ, that they know Christ is their Savior. And I wonder, as we look at our life, are you backslidden today more so than any other time in your life? Or are you growing as you should be and advancing for the cause of Christ? Here we say, he says that we are either blinded or we cannot see afar off or short-sighted if we don't have these characteristics in our life. Uh, verse number 5 through verse number 7 give us those characteristics. We're going to come back and look at those in a minute. But look at verse number 10. It says, Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if ye do these things, ye shall never fall. I've talked to some people every once in a while that You'll mention to them or, or just uh, talk to them about the uh, idea of losing their salvation. And I've heard some people say, you know what, I've, I've felt like I've, I've, I've never doubted my salvation. I've never doubted my salvation. Uh, you know, that's a, that's a blessed thing. But I want you to find here in verse number nine, in verse number 10, that it is a natural occurrence for us to doubt our salvation if we're not living for the Lord. If we're not living for Christ, we will doubt our salvation. Look what he says here. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. The word sure here is the idea of making it established or stable. And he says here that our calling and our election, our salvation, that is a, uh, an idiom kind of just giving us a, a, uh, a word picture of the salvation that we have in Christ and he says, look, our salvation should be sure. There should be some stability in it. We should know that we're saved. And yet, as we think about this, he says, for if ye do these things, ye shall never fall. Praise the Lord that if you put these characteristics in your life, you will never doubt your salvation. If you are living according to these characteristics, you won't struggle with whether we're saved and whether we have a, a, a Christian life that is stable or one that is kind of uh, uh, one that is, is kind of shaky as you consider the salvation that you have in Christ. But a Christian that is not living according to these characteristics will be unfruitful, will be short-sighted, and will be unstable. But look in verse number 11. It says, For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now here's one that is a characteristic of a Christian that is not, uh, not having these victorious principles in their life is maybe one that they don't realize or one that a Christian that is, is carnal does not even consider. And that is this, that they will be a Christian that will be unrewarded. A Christian that will be unrewarded. As he says here, for so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly in the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The picture that he's drawing for us is the reward that we will have when we enter into the next stage of our eternal our eternity. When we stand before Christ at that bemo seat of Christ, and we will be rewarded according to how we've served him and according to how we've loved our Savior. Now, I wonder if you will be a Christian that will be unrewarded. Now, as we look at these characteristics, we find the negative side of this is that if verse number five through verse number seven is not real, if it's not being lived out in your life, then you are going to be a Christian that's unfruitful, one that's not producing like you should. You're going to be short-sighted. You're not going to have a right perspective and a right view of your life and even the future as you look at things approaching. But also, you're going to have a life that is unstable. You're going to be struggling with your eternal security, whether you're saved, whether you really know Christ. If these things are not real, these things are going to be evident in your life. You're also going to be a Christian that's unrewarded. 
at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, when you stand before him at the Bema Seat of Christ, you're going to be losing rewards because you did not have these characteristics evident in your life. Now let's go back to verse number five and look at some characteristics of a Christian that is living in the victorious Christian life. Now in verse number one through verse number four, we see the introduction given to this book. We find them talking about the knowledge that we need to have of God. We need to know God. And as we think about that, I mentioned uh, uh, last week the idea of faith. Faith can either be that as, as an action, we place our faith in Christ. When we accept Christ as our Savior, we are trusting, we're placing our faith in Him that He is the one that can save us and He is the one that can keep us saved. But then also, as you think about faith, when you accept Christ as your Savior, you become a person of faith. It is one that it is the idea of the of the uh, the the thoughts or the the truths of what we know about Christ. Our faith in Christ also helps us know truths about God. The Word of God reveals those things of our faith uh, when we are studying and knowing who God is. And in verse number five through verse number seven, he tells us what we need to add unto that faith, adding to that understanding of who God is. In verse number five, it says, and beside this. Now, in verse number four, he gives us something else to consider because he says here, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. Praise the Lord that when God says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Praise the Lord that when you accept Christ as your Savior, it is not a, I hope that I'm saved, but it is a promise of God that we have Him. We have not just Him, but we also have eternal life. And so we see all the way through the Word of God, those precious and great promises that are given. And in verse number five, he says, and beside this, giving all diligence, the word diligence is the idea of not being lazy. It is someone that is stepping forward and doing what they need to do, giving due diligence. They're being faithful in the Lord. And as you find here, he says, giving all diligence. Don't be lazy in your Christian walk. Don't be lazy in how you serve the Lord. But he says, be all, giving all diligence, add to your faith. Now, what are some things we need to add to our faith? Let's look here. Virtue. Virtue. This idea of virtue is the idea of being someone of character. We need to be a person of character. God desires for the Christian to be a man or a lady of their word, a man, a lady of character. God desires for us to add to our faith virtue and character as we think about our life. As we look at our life, God's plan for us to be Christ-like is the idea that we are a person of character, a person that knows what's right and knows what's wrong, and they are a person of character. They obey the, what is right. But then he goes on to say, and to virtue, knowledge. The idea here of knowledge is that of, of uh, knowing God, knowing biblical principle. We need to know him. Now, if you'll look back in this passage in verse number two, it says, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. We need to be students of the word of God. We need to be students of God. Now, understand this. This isn't something that is just absorbed. This isn't a, an experiential knowledge. This is gnosis. It is the idea of a theoretical knowledge. It's, it is a theory. It is a theoretical knowledge that is something that, that is not just something that we learn by doing. It is something that we study out and we know because God has told it to us and we learn it and we apply it and we memorize it and we know God. Now what he's building upon all the way through First Peter and 2 Peter chapter 1 is that the word of God is vitally important for us to grow as a Christian. Here we find him telling us that we need to add to faith virtue. That is our first principle, that of character, but then also this idea of knowledge. We need to add to virtue, our character, the knowledge of who God is. We need to add to that virtue, the knowledge of God's word. But then he goes on to say into knowledge, temperance. The idea of temperance here is the ability to be able to control yourself. 
this here's a uh, a quote for you. That I'd like to just have you think about also. This quote is this: It is to do uh, temperance is to do as we ought rather than what we want. Doing what we ought rather than what we want. You know what? As a Christian, we even as a Christian still struggle with our flesh, still struggle struggle with this carnal flesh that we have, and there are a lot of things that we want to do. But as a Christian, we need to do what we ought to do. We need to do what we know to do. As we add to knowledge, as we add to what we know of the Word of God, we need to live temperately with this temperance, doing what God wants us to do. We need to be obedient. We need to be faithful. Let's go a little bit further. He goes on to say, not only do we need to be faithful and do we need to know this uh, have this knowledge and be be uh, full of character, having virtue, and then also being temperate, controlling ourselves. He says also, he says, and to temperance, patience. Patience is an interesting word here. It's not the idea of you just being patient. This word here has more of the idea of being steadfast. Being patient in your entire whole life and to who you are. Being steadfast in who God is and who you are as a Christian. We are who we are because of Christ. It's not because of what we've done. It's not because of how good we are. It's not because of what we've been able to accomplish. We are who we are because of who God is. And so as we think about this temperance that needs to be added to temperance, also patience, we need to be faithful, we need to be steadfast, we need to be serving God faithfully in the future. We need to be steadfast in this word of God. And we need to be patient as we run this race, as Paul said, looking unto that finish line that God has before us, and that is that time when we end our life. Today, if you have breath, if you can take in a breath and exhale that breath, God has a plan for your life. God has a plan for you. God has something for you to do today, but you need to step aside and put aside those things that are, uh, that are the weights that does so easily beset you and run with patience that race that is set before you. You need to be steadfast, fighting forward, and pushing forward to be patient as you run this race. God has a plan for you. You know, as we think about all the things that are in our life and all the questions and all the problems and all the difficulties that we have in life, you know what the answer to all of those problems are? It's very simply this. The answers to all of life's problems is quite frankly this. Be like Christ. If you're having marital problems, be like Christ. If you're having uh, relationship problems, be like Christ. If you're having problems in your workplace, be like Christ. All of those things can be answered very plainly by applying the knowledge of the Word of God and being steadfast, being faithful in what you know to do. Be like Christ. God doesn't want us to just look at the problems of life and be like, well, I just guess I can't do any better. I just, I guess I can't be any better than this. Not at all. God desires for us to step out and to do our best as we serve Christ. But you know what? Here's the thing. Do you realize that it doesn't have to happen where it's a, uh, all of the problem is applied to you? It's not a matter of you trying to muster up your ability. We need to just live according to the Holy Spirit. We need to be faithful. We need to be faithful. As we consider our lives, I wonder, are you being faithful? Are you running your race with patience? Are you allowing the Holy Spirit to live through you? Are you walking in the Spirit, as Paul told the church in Galatia? I wonder if that is the case. Here we find the first thing that we need to apply to our life as a victorious Christian is virtue, is character. Secondly, is temperance, having that self-control, having that idea of, of doing what we ought rather than what we want. Uh, and then also knowledge. I missed that one at first. It should be the second thing. Virtue, knowledge, then temperance. 
but then also this idea of patience, steadfastness, faithfulness. But then he goes on to say, and, and to patience, godliness. Godliness. As we consider our life, God desires for us to live like Christ. Turn back to Galatians chapter number 5. Galatians chapter number 5. And look at the work or the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit. And as I say that, understand this. It is the fruit, not fruits. It is the fruit. If we are walking in the Spirit, these things will be evident. Verse number, 15, uh, verse number 16 says this. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Then down in verse number 22, it says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. All those things ought to be evident in our life if they're not you can mark it down. You are not walking in the Spirit. You are not walking in the Spirit. And these things are the evidence, uh, the evidences, those characteristics are the evidences of godliness in our life. They as a whole should be evident as we live for Christ, as we are faithful, as we are showing the fruit of the Spirit. We find virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness. But we next also see into godliness there in verse number seven, brotherly kindness. This idea of brotherly kindness is, is that of brotherly love. It's the, the Philadelphia, as you think of the word there that's used here is Philadelphia. It's the idea of brotherly love. And as you look at this, all of us should show brotherly love to each other. Now, as you consider the understanding of patience, many times as you look back at verse number seven or verse number six, we oftentimes think of patience as we are, are being patient for or patient towards someone. We find here that the patience here is not that. It's the idea of steadfastness. It's the idea of being faithful. But in verse number eight, he now says that we also, or in verse number seven, we also find this idea of brotherly kindness. Brotherly kindness is that patience, is that brotherly kindness, is that brotherly love that we should be showing our brother and sister, not just in Christ, but all those that are around us. Why? Because they're good people? No. Because they treat us right? No. Because they're doing exactly what they should be doing? No. Because God calls us to be showing brotherly kindness, brotherly love to each other. He says, this is a command. In fact, I want you to go back to verse number five, because he says here, and beside this, giving all diligence, this idea of not being lazy, but then he says, add to your faith. The idea of the word add is an imperative. He's saying, you must do this. If you want to live in a victorious Christian life, you must show virtue. You must show knowledge, having the knowledge of God. Not only that, you should also have uh, this idea of temperance and the patience and the godliness and the brotherly kindness. All of these things should be evident. But then he goes one step further and he says into brotherly kindness, charity. Now, brotherly kindness is that idea of we're showing that kindness to others around us. But the charity that he says here is that idea of agape love. It is, it is more than just a love that we have for people. It is a God love. It is a love with others in perspective and in focus, not in us. It is agape love. See, it's more than just showing kindness to your brother and sister in Christ, but it is that we are loving, focused on others more than ourselves. Whether they're saved, whether they're not saved, whoever it is, we need to love them as Christ loved us and gave himself for us. We need to be loving others the same way. There are seven characteristics of living as a victorious Christian. And if we are not living as a victorious Christian, then we will be unfruitful. We will be short-sighted. We will be unstable. And in the future, we're going to be unrewarded. 
And I hope that none of us want to be in that characteristic as a Christian. That those things are evident in our life. But that we are victorious. That we are living according to the will of God. And that we are showing fruitfulness. That we are not barren, but we're producing the, the fruit of Christ. The fruit of God. And that we have a right perspective, that we're not short-sighted, but we are looking at everything coming at us through the lens of the Word of God. And then also that we're established, that we're stable, that we have a surety of our salvation, that we're not doubting it, but we know it to be true. But not only that, that we are going to be rewarded. God says that He is faithful. He will reward us. In fact, Turn over to uh, Hebrews chapter number 11 as we close th this evening. Hebrews chapter number 11, and I want you to look there at verse number 6. It says, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. He is a rewarder. And so as we consider this idea as being a victorious Christian, we need to be a people that are fruitful. As a victorious Christian, we need to be a people, a Christian that is not short-sighted, but that we have the right perspective in life. We know through the eyes and the lens of God that he is at work in every situation in our life. But then also that we are established. We are sure of our salvation. And then also, lastly, that we are going to be rewarded in the future. But how does that happen? Once again, it's those seven principles. Add to your faith, virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience. As you find even this, godliness, brotherly kindness, and charity. If those seven things are right in your life, you can mark it down. You will be a victorious Christian. And I hope that you desire to be a victorious Christian. I hope you desire to be fruitful, to have the right perspective, to be sure of your salvation, and to be rewarded in the future. I hope you desire to be a victorious Christian. Add to your faith, virtue, knowledge, temperance. Add to your temperance, patience, also godliness, and brotherly kindness and charity. Have these things evident in your life. Let's be a victorious Christian. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for today. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity of giving us very basically just condensed down so just so uh, briefly here in this passage how we ought to be as a victorious Christian. And Lord, I pray that you would help us, Lord, not to be content living as a carnal Christian or a Christian that is unfruitful, a, a Christian that is short-sighted. Lord, help us not be content living as a Christian that's doubting our salvation, and also even as a Christian that will go unre and that will go unrewarded in the future. Lord, help us to be faithful. Help us to be a victorious Christian. Allow us, Lord, help us to be faithful in adding to these characteristics into our life. Lord, help us to be full of character, a person of virtue. Lord, help us to be full of knowledge of your word and who you are. Help us to be temperate, controlling ourselves through the Holy Spirit. Help us, Lord, to be patient. Help us, Lord, to be steadfast, unmovable. Lord, help us to be faithful. Help us to be godly. Help us to have those characteristics of the Lord of, the Lord, of you in our lives. Lord, help us to be full of brotherly kindness. Lord, help us to be full of love, to show the charity that you desire for us to have, and help us to show it to others. Lord, help us to love others more than ourselves. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us, Lord, not to be content to be a carnal Christian, but that we would be content moving forward, fighting on to be looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ and getting your word into our life and pressing on with patience the race that you set before us. Lord, help us to be victorious Christians. 
And Lord, I pray that you'd meet with us in a great way. Help us, Lord, just to grow in you. Allow the Holy Spirit to be faithful. And Lord, help us to be faithful to that Holy Spirit, Lord, that we would grow to be the victorious Christian that you want us to be. And help us to add all these things to our faith. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for being here with us tonight. Please be looking forward to that message that I'll be sending out on Friday about when we will be joining together very soon. And so hope that you'll be praying for that and be looking forward to it. And we'll be looking forward to being able to get back together and worshiping the Lord collectively as a body. And so I hope you have a wonderful evening and thank you for being with us.